This week on the podcast, we talk about the actors' strike, arrests in West Papua, and 10 years of the horrendous offshore detention regime. This podcast was recorded on stolen Gadigal land. Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nations justice. Welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left News Podcast. I'm Isaac Nellist, and today I'm joined by Green Left journalist Leo Earl. Yeah, good to be with you in the studio, Isaac, recording this week's news. Yeah, we've got a lot of good stories this week. Um, first of all, uh, July 19 marked 10 years since former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd said that refugees would not be settled in Australia. And that began a decade of boat turnbacks and offshore detention and a decade of trauma and fear for people who are looking for a safe place to call home. Now the Nauru Detention Centre is emptied, but the Albanese government is still spending $350 million a year to maintain infrastructure. As we've discussed on previous episodes, there's rallies taking place across the country, including some that will have already happened by the time you're listening to this. Um, But there's nearly 10,000 people who arrived in Australia before 2013 who are either waiting on a decision about their refugee status They've either been denied their refugee status or have lost their visa due to some minor minor legal infractions. And there's also 14,000 refugees stranded in Indonesia who are unable to come to Australia, but they're stuck in a country that has no rights for refugees. So there's still a huge amount to be done to improve refugee rights in this country. And hopefully these rallies over the weekend will put pressure on the government to process the remaining refugee claims and grant permanent protection and settlement for refugees. You mentioned the rallies coming up across the country. One of these was the protest held outside Treasurer Jim Chalmers' office in Mianjin, Brisbane, on the July 19 anniversary. Activists delivered a letter to Chalmers saying, quote, we need more than small, pragmatic policy shifts, as many are still being left behind, unquote. The letter called for a, quote, complete break with toxic, punitive, anti-refugee policies, unquote, and express concern about the maintenance of empty detention facilities on Nauru and continuing boat towback policies. We don't always have um, good news stories on this podcast, uh, but here's a great victory for people power as the National Australia Bank, or NAB, decided not to renew a loan of $1 billion to Whitehaven Coal, which is the country's biggest coal mining company. And this decision comes off the back of a massive national campaign was calling on NAB to stop funding coal projects, which included more than 150 actions uh, organised by 60 grassroots teams across the country. Climate campaign group Move Beyond Coal, who have been driving this campaign, said that NAB's announcement sends a clear message to the coal industry, financial institutions and the government that the movement against coal is powerful. And 150 people joined a Move Beyond Coal webinar to discuss this announcement um, and all agreed that there's still more work to be done but this represents a massive opportunity in the campaign to stop fossil fuels. Last episode, we discussed the Talisman Sabre war games that are starting this month involving the Australian and US militaries, as well as a bunch of other countries. Now, the Independent and Peaceful Australia Network, or IPAN, and the Pacific Peace Network have organised an anti-war calling for a peaceful Pacific conference. Taking place on July 29 in Mianjin, the conference will host speakers from Pacific Islands that are currently occupied by U.S. military bases. IPAN spokesperson Annette Brownlee told Green Left that the aim of the conference is to shine a light on the militarization happening in the Pacific as the confrontation between China and the U.S. builds up. The conference will be followed by a protest against Talisman Sabre the next day at Inogura Army Barracks, as well as a speaking tour with public meetings in Gaddy, Sydney, Naganwal, Canberra and Garamilla, Darwin. Find more details on the Green Left website. Yeah, and speaking of kind of anti-war campaigns, there was a protest held in Nam or Melbourne against the $368 billion AUKUS nuclear-powered submarines, and that was organised by Meribet councillors Sue Bolton and Monica Hart on July 15. And more than 200 people joined the community rally, including the Riff Raff Radical Marching Band. The protest was supported by several unions as well as climate justice groups, demanding that the billions be instead invested in housing, healthcare, and climate action. And back in April, Bolton and Hart led a successful motion in council declaring that Mary Beck remains nuclear-free and opposing the AUKUS deal. Now, we're about to talk about what's happening internationally, but before that, I wanted to plug two upcoming forums that Green Left is hosting on the topic of housing as a human right. 
the first of these is in Nam uh, on Thursday, the 27th of July at 6.30 p.m. at the Multicultural Hub on Elizabeth Street, featuring Mary Beck Socialist Alliance Councillor Sue Bolton and Greens MP uh, Gabrielle de Vietri. Then on August 1st in Sydney at the Resistance Centre on 22 Mountain Street, Ultimo, there'll be another forum featuring Greens MP and housing spokesperson Max Chandler Mather, who's joining via Zoom, CFMEU and former Builders Labourers Federation member John Koch, Margaret Kelly from the Save Barrack Beacon campaign via Zoom, and Ishbel Dunsmore from the Sydney Uni SRC, and Dr. Alistair Sisson from Action for Public Housing. So you can check out the links in the description for more information on those upcoming forums. Actors in the United States have stopped work shutting down most film and television productions as the Screen Actors Guild, American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, went on strike on July 14. SAG-AFTRA represents 160,000 actors across the United States, and pickets were established outside major Hollywood studios in eight locations, including LA and New York. Many prominent actors such as Susan Sarandon and others have joined the pickets, and the strike prohibits actors from acting on sets but also from promoting their films in interviews and attending red carpet events. And most actors uh, live paycheck to paycheck without really any benefits. And many cannot access health insurance, um, which is a big deal in the US in particular. Um, and actors say they're fed up with the exorbitant salaries of studio bosses, such as Disney CEO Bob Iger's $27 million a year contract, which works out actually be about $70,000 a day, which is apparently the average actor's wage for a year. So that's pretty crazy. And actors want a fairer share of the wealth being generated by the streaming industry. And this actually follows screenwriters going on strike in May over similar concerns. And actors and writers have not been on strike at the same time since 1960. And part of why this is a big deal, I think, is that Hollywood actors are so recognizable that to see them taking a stand against the bosses and going on strike could encourage people to get involved in their own unions and fight for uh, better pay and working conditions. Yeah, definitely. Popularizing striking. Yeah, it's, it's really cool to see. July 27 marks the 70th anniversary of the Armistice Agreement to end fighting in the Korean War in 1953. However, a peace agreement was never signed and the Korean Peninsula remains divided and bristling with weapons, including nuclear weapons. There is a growing campaign for a real peace agreement that includes removing nuclear weapons and real dialogue and cooperation between North and South Korea. Green Left's Peter Boyle interviewed Su Yong Hwang from the Korean Peace Appeal about the campaign and the United States' attempts to further militarize the region. So check out the video on the Green Left website and sign the international petition at en.endthekoreanwar.net slash appeal. And they strike uh, by nearly 7,500 dock workers in Canada last week um, came to an end as the International Longshore and Warehouse Union reached a tentative agreement with the bosses. But now the workers are back on strike. So according to the union, the agreement came just 10 minutes before a deadline that was imposed by Federal Labor Minister Seamus O'Regan. And the deadline was criticized as a coercive move by the government that implied a threat of back-to-work legislation, which O'Regan characterized it as a forceful nudge. Um, the full terms of that deal were not announced publicly, but the ILWU internal caucus has rejected the deal, saying it does not believe the recommendations had the ability to protect our jobs now or into the future. Green Left Canada correspondent Jeff Shantz writes that by rejecting the deal, the ILWU internal caucus stood firm against the efforts of government and the Employees Association and defied the government's forceful nudge. The strike is showing the importance of economic action at choke points in supply chains with a massive impact on rail, forest, oil and petroleum products, mineral, sand, clay and chemicals. About 20% of US trade arrives at the ports of Vancouver and Prince Rupert that are at the heart of these strikes. And as one newsport described, when pickets went back up, chance of an injury to one, an injury to all, and one day longer, one day stronger, were heard from ILWU members. So all power to the, that campaign. Damn, yeah, that's really inspiring. 
Indonesian security forces are cracking down on West Papuan activists, arresting 10 members of the West Papua National Committee on July 11. The next day, security forces attacked a demonstration supporting West Papua's application to become a member of the Melanesian Spearhead Group. A number of demonstrators were arrested and others beaten, including a 15-year-old who was hit on the head with a rifle butt. Banners and flags were confiscated and activists taken to the Jayapura police station. The Australia West Papua Association condemned the arrest and spokesperson Joe Collins told Green Left he had hoped the demonstration would be allowed to go ahead peacefully. He called on the Australian government not to turn a blind eye to the human rights abuses committed by Indonesia in West Papua. And in a major step towards the formal recognition of the Anthropocene as a new stage in Earth's history, scientists have identified a small lake near Toronto as the best marker of epochal change. The tiny Crawford Lake is in a legally protected conservation area close to the city of Milton, and it's unusual because it's meromitic, meaning it's composed of layers of water that do not intermix. This has allowed centuries of sinking materials to form sharply defined layers of sediment, comparable to like the rings on a tree, uh, with a precise year-by-year record of local, regional, and global environment change. So frozen cores that have been pulled up from the lake bottom have shown distinct layers formed since the middle of the 20th century that contain carbon particles from high-energy power production, plutonium from nuclear tests, as well as chemical fertilizers and other pollutants such as acid rain. None of that existed until well after World War II, marking a clear division between the end of the Holocene epoch and the beginning of the Anthropocene. Despite this, there's still significant debate around the acceptance of the Anthropocene as a new epoch, and there's likely to be a deciding vote uh, among scientists taking place at the International Geological Congress in South Korea in August next year. And you can read more about all of these stories we've talked about today, plus videos, detailed analysis, and book and music reviews at greenleft.org.au. Rallies, forums and vigils are taking place around the country to say no more Hiroshima's, no more AUKUS on Hiroshima Day on August 6. On August 6 and 9 in 1945, the US detonated two atomic bombs over the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, killing between 129 to 226,000 people, mostly civilians. Join these rallies to say never again and to protest the AUKUS alliance, nuclear subs and the drive to war against China. The rallies will take place on August 6 in Borloo or Perth at Perth Cultural Centre at 2pm, in Gaddy at Sydney Town Hall at 2pm, Mianjin at King George Square at 2pm, Mulum Bimba or Newcastle at Hunter Peace Park at 11am, Tharawal or Wollongong at the Church on the Mall at 4pm, Tardanya or Adelaide at Makuda or Hindmarsh Square at 2pm, and on August 4 in Geelong at 5pm at Little Mallop Street Mall. And you can find more details for all of these events at greenleft.org.au slash events. Greenleft needs your support to continue. You can become a supporter for only $5 a month and donate to our 2023 Fighting Fund to help us make more content like this. Go to greenleft.org.au forward slash support to help us out. And remember to follow Green Left on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Threads and TikTok for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening.